So um, hello everyone, my name is Liz Gillis and I am delighted to be doing this talk uh, for the RSE Cornelia um, Virtual Spring Festival um, about the daughters of James Connolly, Nora and Ina. Um, and their story is fascinating and when you look at their background and their parents, like these girls were always going to do something but the huge influence both their father James and their mother Lily had on them was amazing and it stayed with them throughout their lives. Um, so I suppose when we are looking at uh, Nora and Ina we do have to go back to the beginning to where it all began and that's the course with James and Lily. Um, so they are married in 1890 and uh, very soon the kids began to follow. Uh, Mona was born first, Mo uh, Nora was the second daughter, she was born in 1893 followed by Aideen and then Ina followed in 1896. Um, Mona, Nora and Aideen had been born in Edinburgh um, and then Ina was the first child born in Dublin when the family moved back to Ireland. And because she was uh, James's first child born in Ireland, he put the little pet name on her, his Irish Molly. Um, and that's what he always referred to her as. Uh, Ina was followed then by Maura. And then their only child or their only their only son, Roddy, was born. Um, and then the last child, Fiona, was then born. So you can see there one, two, three, four, five, six, seven children um, in the, the, the Connolly family. Now, when they moved from Scotland, uh, they moved to the inner city of Dublin. And I suppose there are very similarities in both communities that they lived in, in that um, they're very poor working class areas. And again, you see this, how this impacted on the lives of both Ina and Nora and, and all the Connolly children really, because they were witness to what was actually happening on the streets of Dublin. Um, they themselves experienced the dire poverty that existed. Um, James Connolly, this is one of his main objectives in his life, was to you know improve the lives of the working class people in Dublin. But if you consider that Dublin was the second city of the British Empire at the time, um, the O'Connell Street, which was the main thoroughfare of Dublin City, a beautiful street, but yet you went a block either side of O'Connell Street and you were into the worst slums in Europe. Now, they had various addresses, um, but a, a lovely connection that I, I always like to make is that they actually lived around the corner from where I'm from um, in the Liberties. They lived in number 54 Pimlico. Um, and Liberties is one of the oldest communities in Dublin, but there was tremendous poverty in that community, like all the working class areas um, in, in Dublin at that time. Um, and by 1900, that is where the family were living. That's actually where Roddy was born. And I don't know if you have seen it, but if you haven't, go on to the RTE Daily Archives website and you have a 1916 exhibition there. And there's two interviews, one with Nora and one with Ina. Um, they were done around 1966, 1965. And it's both of them talking about their experiences, but they sort of reflect very differently. Like Nora talks about um, seeing her dad for the last time in Dublin Castle and our activities in 1916. Um, Ina talks more about what it was like to be a, a, a kid at that time, what family life was like. Um, now, what you get from both accounts um, and from the testimonies of both girls um, is that they were their father's shadow. Um, James Connolly and Lily Connolly adored their children and he took all of his kids everywhere with him to meetings um you, you name it he was with them and um, he really truly adored his children but Ina actually talks about number 54 Pimlico she talks about Roddy being born in that house um and even though they weren't there for a very long time James Connolly always kept a connection with the Liberties um even while he was there he he did a lot of work for the people in the area. As I said, there was a uh, dire poverty, lots of tenements in the area, but there was this uh, this new housing scheme 
that was built around the 1880s, uh, set up by the Artisans Wellens. And this was like as a result of the four slum clearances in Dublin. So it was improved housing. Um, it was for tradesmen, so not um, the, the sort of ordinary labourers. Um, so people with trades. Um, and because of that, the rent was a little bit higher but it was for people who could afford it so you had to have been in an established trade um now the thing was when james Connolly was living in pimlico um word rent went around that they were going to increase the rent in these houses which were just off gray street just literally around the corner from number 54 and james Connolly organized a meeting to protest against this and um, very successful because the rents weren't put up so even though he was there for not many years he made a direct impact a positive impact um on the community in the liberties um they remained in or he remained in ireland until 1903 that's when he went to america to find work um, and he was followed out to america by the family the following year now tragedy did strike and um, because the night before the family were were meant to follow out. Um, Mona, their eldest daughter, um, tragically died um, as a result of an accident. Um, she was washing some clothes in preparation for the journey um, and her apron got caught um, when, at the fire. Uh, the apron caught fire and um, she received horrific burns and she died a day or two after. Um, but unfortunately, when James Connolly was waiting for Lily, and their seven children, it was Lily and six that came. Um, Ina was actually with her when that happened, and that had a terrible, terrible traumatic impact um, on Ina, as you can imagine, um, who was only, what, seven, eight years of age at the time. Um, now, they remained in America and the girls, both of them actually talk about how life was actually an improvement in America. For the first time, they actually lived in a house and they had a garden because in Dublin, they were living in tenements. James Con Connolly lived amongst the people he was fighting for. He wasn't a person that was talking about, you know, improving conditions for people, but not actually knowing about them. He knew exactly what the people of Dublin were living every day single day as did his doors um, and unfortunately I suppose for the girls in terms of their, their living conditions in America and um, a bit like Tom Clark James Connolly just had this grow for Ireland it was always pulling them back um, and he did return to Ireland and um, you have his involvement with the I, uh, ITGWU uh, James Larkin's union and he was then sent up to Belfast um, to be the branch secretary uh, of the Belfast branch up there. Now just to show you there is a photograph of number 54 and just to show you exactly um, to prove I'm, I'm, I'm not sort of lying about this where James Connolly did actually experience what the normal people at Dublin were experiencing at the time. So there is number 54 Pimlico now it's long gone now and um, there were flats built on it it's, it's a part of it's a car park now of the flat complex at Pimlico but this is the 1911 census so it was in this house that Roddy was born um, and there we have the the entry for the Connolly family and you can see um, even from like what well, Ina is only for no, yeah, Ina is only four years of age at that time. Yeah, she has it down, or they have it down that she was a scholar. And that was a thing about the, the Connolly children. They were educated from a very, very young age. And that was obviously thanks to their mother, Lily, who had been a, a governess um, and really strongly believed in education. Education was freedom, education was power. Um, and this is something you find with, with women at that time, women starting to become involved in the revolutionary movement because they themselves had not had access to education because they were women. That changed in the late 1800s. And with that came such freedom. And this is what they try to impart on those communities that don't have access to that privilege, um, especially in the working class areas. But look at how many people lived in number 54. You've got two to six families. So six families living in that one house, 30 people in all. So nobody can say James Connolly did not understand what 
ordinary people were going through and not just in Dublin, but in working class areas across Ireland, across the world, the situation was pretty much the same. Now, when they moved to Belfast, um, Nora actually was the first one to go to Belfast because it was very difficult to find work in Dublin. Um, and there, there was more opportunities in Belfast. So she made her way up. And of course, she was soon followed by her father, who went up as branch secretary for the ITGWU. Um, and they settled in one Glendalina Terrace. And I'm sorry if I've pronounced that wrong, um, which was just on the Falls Road. And you can see a, a, a nice property. Um, and again, not just James. James obviously gets involved in his trade union activities, but his daughters, um, because they had been witness to his work from a very, very young age, they join him. They're with him at meetings. They're helping him, you know, with his work. Um, so activists from a very, very young age. Um, and again, like what he did in Pimlico, wherever James Connolly went, he had an impact. Um, and he certainly had an impact in Belfast where he led the Docker strike. Um, he fought for the... Uh, the laundry work or the female mill workers and was very successful in them gaining rights um, and I suppose it, it, it sort of unique achievements that we can um, we can certainly attribute to Connolly is that he was able to unite the working class from both uh, sides of the community because this is what is so important that regardless of your religion if you're working class you've got the same issues regardless of whether you're Protestant or Catholic, um, is again, the same across the country. And that was a huge achievement at that time that he did unite um, both sides of the community to further um, improve the lives of the working class people. Now, again, um, the girls. So again, you know, as I said at the start, there was no way that these girls were not going to be involved in something. You know, whether it was the revolution, whether it was trade unionism, something they were going to be involved in. And with parents like James Lily Connolly, it was just a given. But you had Nafina Aaron um, set up in 1909, and this was co-founded by Bulmer Hobson and Countess Markovich. Now, Countess Markovich, a great friend of James Connolly's, um, but she had been a member of Anina Nehair, and that was the militant Republican women's organization set up in 1900 by Maud Gaughan in Dublin. Um, and it's like the forerunner to coming them on. Um, but at the time, you had Baden Powell's Boy Scout movement thriving in England, all across England. Um, and the thing with Baden Powell's Boy Scouts was that it was pretty much, you know, creating future soldiers. And there were the there was the Boy Scout movement in Ireland. Countess Markovich really took exception to this, um, as she believed that if Irish boys, um, Irish boys should not be literally being taught to fight for the British Empire. Um, we should actually, you know, set up our own Boy Scouts, and that happened in 1909. And those two organisations, Anina and Nafina, are the two most important organisations, I certainly believe, when it comes to the Irish Revolution, because without them, you wouldn't have come them on, and you certainly would not have had um, the Irish volunteers. And you then have with Anina um, the crossover with the Irish Citizen Army when that was founded in 1913. So you have the links with James Connolly right there. Um, but the thing about Nafina was, it was an all-boys organisation. One exception, and it was the Betsy Grace Lewis up in Belfast. And this is where Nora and Ina and their friends um, became really involved. So it started off maybe about 20 girls. Uh, the membership increased to about 50. But Nora and Ina were uh, senior officers in the Betsy Grace Lewis, the only female contingent of Nafina Aaron. And Nafina was a nationwide organisation. Um, now, this is a great photograph um, and we've got Ina there uh, left in the front row and Lily Kempson um, in the middle. And again, I love when you find these connections because it, it, it just shows that the local story is how you tell the national story. You cannot have the national story without making those local connections. Lily Kempston was again from Dublin, from Golden Lane, originally from Wicklow, but lived in Golden Lane. Um, and that's just, just a stone's throw from the Liberties. Um, but here they are in their uniforms um, of the 
the female branch of the Fianna Aaron. Um, and they drilled in St. Mary's Hall um, in Belfast. And in the 1914 lockout, because everyone threw in their lot with the 1914 lockout, the Anina women, uh, the Fianna, um, the Irish Citizen Army was born out of the 1914 lockout because there was no one to protect the police who are meant to protect everyone um, sided with the employers and attacked the workers who were on strike um, and you know who was there to protect the workers no one so a citizen's army was born but when you have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of men and women out of work um, no money coming in funds had to be raised and the Betsy Grace Lua played their part um, they couldn't do much um, in Belfast apart from uh, raised funds which they did but every little helped because people literally were on the brink um, of starvation now the Betsy Grace Lua it, it did disband in 1915 because by that stage you had Coming a Mon set up that was set up in uh, April 1914 um, and Ina was actually at the inaugural meeting of Coming a Mon she was with Countess Markovic she regularly came down to Dublin from Belfast and stayed with Countess and um, really strong connections between the Countess and the Connolly family um, which which never ceased. Um, but like the Betsy Grace Lua and Nina Naharan also disbanded um, because Common and Mon was set up, um, they were created, they, they had branches. So as the volunteers had battalions and brigades, Common and Mon had branches and a branch would work alongside a company or battalion of volunteers. Um, so when Nina became a branch of Common and Mon, the most militant branch of coming them on alongside the women of the Irish Citizen Army who were trained in the use of weapons and so on. Now, Nora, she set up the Belfast branch of coming them on. So you can see this continuation and um, there's all of these little connections um, within all of these movements. But one thing that the girls were involved in, and it goes back to the Fianna, was the host gun running. And um, which happened on 26th of July 1914. So basically, you had the uh, the the 1912 Home Rule uh, was put on the statute books. Take a, a couple of years to come into effect, but as a result of this, you have the Ulster Volunteer Force being set up to resist the introduction of Home Rule. But there was always eyes down here watching what was happening up in Ulster, and if there was no one to to protect Home Rule. What was going to happen so the irish volunteers were set up to protect home rule and um, the uvf landed guns at larn uh, they were allowed to land guns at larn no problem there's great images paintings um of of that uh, event and you see the military and the police let it happen um, so the irish volunteers decided that they would import arms and the uvf had imported the weapons from Germany. Um, and these of both of these events are before the First World War broke out. Um, so in July, the Irish volunteers decided that they would import weapons from uh, from Germany and they would be landed at Holt. Now it fell to the Fianna. They were given special responsibility to take away the arms. Um, as Bulma Hobson said, they were the only ones disciplined enough to, to do this job, to be responsible enough, because the difference between the FINA and the Irish Volunteers is the FINA had been in existence since 1909. The Irish Volunteers were only in existence a year. Um, and actually, the officers of the first officers of the volunteers had been members of Nafina. So these were really clued in kids. Um, you had to be over 15 years of age to take part in the host gun running. And you can see these, these photographs. Um, there they are, lined up, waiting for the guns to come in. And the next photograph on my right, you see them all marching off with some of the rifles um, and the ammunition. The girls were not allowed to take part. Um, now, Nora and Ina were down in Dublin, and there's a great uh, account in Ina's statement, I think it is, and she really took exceptions to this because the Fianna boys sort of rubbed their noses in it, that they were off on this special job, but because they were girls, they couldn't take part. Um, and Nora is trying to calm Ina down. We'll, we'll see a sort of in the next slide. But um, 
but they did have a connection to the whole gun running in that the girls were then asked to bring up rifles to Belfast that had been landed at Holt. So there is a tenuous connection to Holt. Um, we'll take it. But um, as you can see there, the Holt gun running was very different to learn because the military and police are waiting for them. They were determined to not let those guns be landed. They failed completely. Um, and even the FINA, when the military, the King's Own Scottish Borders, they, they tried to take the guns. And there are accounts in newspapers where the FINA boys gave as good as they got. They hung on to those rifles for dear life. And the military only managed to get a few. Unfortunately, of course, we have the events that follow, which was the Bachelor's Walk massacre where the, the military were making their way back into town from Holt to go to their, bar, their barracks, which is now Collins Barracks Museum, it had been the Royal Barracks. Um, and they were jeered by the crowds. They had heard what had gone on. Um, they were jeered by the crowds. And as they came on to the Liffey, heading up Bachelor's Walk, um, the crowds got bigger, the jeers got louder, and they opened fire, killing four people, three immediately, and one uh, died later. Um, Nora and I uh, took part in the funerals of the Bachelor's Walk victims. Um, so you can see there a huge difference in the treatment of the UVF compared to the Irish volunteers. But um, as I said, Ina was not impressed. Um, the fact that because she was a girl, she was not allowed to take part in the whole gun running. Um, and she talked about uh, Countess Markovich and Countess Markovich is trying to calm her down. And as I said, Nora's trying to calm her down. But then, as I said, the girls were tasked with the responsibility of bringing some of those guns up to Belfast. And you can see here how the Countess sort of uh, played around Ina to maybe, you know, make her feel a little bit better. And um, she says here, the dear Countess said, uh, you are the first women to run guns up to the north. Show Eddie Carson what you can do. Deliver them safely is all I ask. And I have every confidence in you. Um, a FINA member will drive you up in his car. He knows nothing of what you're bringing and will deny anything you say. You must be pre prepared to take full responsibility. And if you're caught, you know nothing, heard nothing. Only got the chance of a lift home from your holidays by this stranger you met at a dance who was going on his holidays. Is that clear? Um, and the guns were were safely delivered up to Belfast. So I suppose it made up in a small way to the fact that she couldn't take place in the actual events. Um, now, when we come to 1916, Nora was aware um, of the plans of the Rising um, through her father. So the family were still in Belfast, um, but James Connolly had been spending more time in Dublin, and um, certainly um, in the very early months of 1916. Now, with the Irish citizen army, James Connolly was going to strike a blow um, for Irish freedom, but for the workers of Ireland as well. Um, but at the same time, you have the Irish volunteers, the Military Council of the IRB planning their rebellion in secret because the First World War was uh, in full swing and Tom Clark was determined not to let that opportunity slide. Um, and they saw that Connolly would sort of disrupt their plans because they knew he was going to strike. Connolly was getting impatient with the Irish volunteers. They had him kidnapped and um, he was brought to Dolphin's Barn. Again, stones throw away from the Liberties. If I can make a connection with the Liberties, I will. Um, and they then come to this agreement where they will work together. But Connolly was very much aware of the difference between the Irish volunteers and the Citizen Army, which he was proven right in the long run. Um, class was a huge issue when it came to the Irish Free State. But um, Liam Mellows, and again, you have all these little connections because Liam Mellows was one of the first members of Nafina. Um, so he had known the Connolly girls. Um, they knew Con Colbert. They knew Eamon Martin. They knew all the big names in Nafina, and it went on to become even bigger names in the War of Independence and Civil War. Um, but he shortly before the rising he was arrested and deported to England um, and this was a huge blow to the Irish volunteers the plans of the military council because Lee Mellows was responsible for Galway for ensuring that Galway would rise and um, when the time came so they had to get him back so Nora was chosen by her dad to go to England to get him back. And she went with Liam's brother, Barney Mellows, and they looked very similar. And the plan was that they would find out where he was. They didn't even know where he was in England. So they arrive in England and they're trying to find out where he was actually taken. Um, because he wasn't in prison, he was just sort of sent, sent away. Um, they discovered that he was living with relatives in Leek. So the plan was that they would go and visit him 
Um, and basically Barney would swap places with him. And no one would be any the wiser that it was Barney that was there and not Liam. And that's exactly what happens. Now, Nora had to then, you know, walk away with him, uh, get them up, get him up to Scotland. So they had to get trained from Leek to Scotland. Then they had to get the boat from Scotland to uh, Belfast. And he was dressed as a priest. And she, Nora talks about it like in um, our uh, interview with Andrew McCown and survivors and in our uh, witness statement, um, just about like, you know, British soldiers, when you see them and they're tipping their hat to Lee Mellows, who's dressed as a priest, no one knew that was Lee Mellows um, that, that was there. And and they arrive back safely. Uh, Lee Mellows is back in Ireland and Nora sent word to her dad in Liberty Hall. She sent a postcard to him. And what she say um, on the postcard? Um, I'm just going to get the text here and um, everything is grand we're back home Peter and that was her little uh, nom de plura as she says um, that she was signed to her dad and Liam Mellows he did what he was meant to do in the East Horizon he did ensure that Galway rose um, at that time and later on he after the rise and he went to America he escaped to America um, but that wasn't Nora's and Ina's only job um, connected with the East Horizon because of course they were themselves involved and um, they were to be with the uh, volunteers the Belfast volunteers but in Tyrone um, but of course, the, the countermanding order that Owen McNeil issued, it, it, it caused chaos. So the date had been set, 23rd of April. Um, Owen McNeil had been duped. He was the uh, officer in charge uh, or the commanding officer of the Irish Volunteers. And the rise had been planned completely behind his back. He was completely unaware of what was going to happen. And when he did discover what was going to happen, he issued the countermanding order. Um, now, the girls they were in Toronto, they were in Coal Island, they were meeting all the volunteers up there and they talk about how word was coming through that it, it wasn't going to happen. So they wanted to find out and made their way down to Dublin where they got into Liberty Hall to see their dad. Now they had to actually, you know, really fight to try and see their father, you know, do you know who I am type of thing? And the daughter James Conley because the volunteers and the Citizen Army, especially in Liberty, in Liberty Hall, the Citizen Army were so protective of Conley. Now, at that time, of course, you had the whole military council pretty much in Liberty Hall. But Liberty Hall for that week prior to the rising was like, was the headquarters. James Conley had gotten pretty much all the Citizen Army people into Liberty Hall because they feared that there could be roundups and so on. So if the authorities were going to come looking for them, they'd have a fight on their hands. Um, and over the, 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 the Sunday and the Monday, the girls were going to and fro. They were met, sent to meet Thomas Clark, Sean McDermott. They were accompanied by, there was six of them all together, including the core sisters, Elizabeth and Nell. Um, and they had to tell the leaders exactly what was happening up in Tyrone. Um, James asked Nora, would, would she stay down? And she was like, no, I have to go back up. Um, and that was what she taught and Ina, it was the last time that Ina saw her dad when they left on Easter Monday, armed with word that uh, Dublin was going to rise at 12 o'clock and they were to await orders. Um, Ina wants to actually bring a proclamation up back up to Tyrone, but Patrick Pierce said no, it was too risky, just sort of give her the content um, to, to sort of verbally give the content to the volunteers. But like everywhere, um, you know, the volunteers in Tyrone, it, it didn't happen. The fighting was mainly centred in Dublin, places like Galway, Wexford. You had a few outbreaks in Cork, but nothing on the scale that was planned. Um, and Nora and Ina did their best to rally. Um, they were, Ina certainly was bringing guns all over the place, but it was not to be. And they decided that they would make their way back to Dublin uh, by the end of the week. But because the trains had been stopped, um, it was only the military that were using the trains, and um, they got as far as Dundalk and had to walk from Dundalk to Dublin. And again, there's, there's, you, can, you can sort of imagine that you can picture in their testimonies and their witness statements where they arrive in Dublin and it was Sunday, the 30th of April, and the, the, the fighting was over. 
the streets were deathly silent um, and they went to the house of the Ryan sisters um, where they were told of the surrender and that their father had been wounded. Um, now, of course, after the surrender, um, the volunteers were taken into custody and um, you have the majority, pretty much all of the prisoners, the leadership being taken to Richmond Barracks where the court martials began or where were held. And after the court martials, uh, the prisoners were then brought to Comanum Jail to await the sentence. Um, 97 were sentenced to death in all. You had 14 executed in Comanum and two men elsewhere, Roger Casement and Thomas Kent. Now, James Connolly, of course, was not taken to Richmond Barracks. He's the only leader that's not taken to Richmond Barracks because he had been wounded during the fight and shot in the ankle and the wound obviously got infected and he was dying from the wound and he was taken to Dublin Castle, um, which was a, a Red Cross hospital at the time. And once Nora and Lily, their mother, got ward, um, they were able to see him in Dublin Castle. And again, that interview Nora's interview, you've probably all seen it, where she is talking about that last meeting with her dad. Now, there's another interview that Roddy gave, because Roddy, who was 16 at the time, he served in the GPO as dad. But what you see with these interviews is the difference, I suppose, um, the way Conley sort of saw how his kids could cope with a situation and his his relationship with his kids. So with Nora, it's like, be strong. He has to be strong. He doesn't break down. Um, Ina is a daddy's girl. And you see that like, you know, when, when, when she, what she's talking about, but Roddy, and he talks about being in GPO with him. And Roddy was sent away on the Wednesday and he was sent to, with a dispatch to William O'Brien because Connolly knew with the bombardment that had begun that they, they really weren't going to get out of this alive and he could not risk his son dying. So Roddy didn't want to go, but Connolly insists that he go, but he, he breaks down in front of Roddy. He doesn't break down in front of Nora. With Nora is to be strong, but with his only boy, he does break down. Um, Roddy did get away, but he was arrested and um, he was taken to Richard Barracks, but they gave him a false name or he gave a false name because if you can imagine the fear that if the authorities knew that he had James Connolly's son, um, you know, what could happen, especially when we consider what happened to James Connolly. But um, here we have um, a, just a, a segment of Nora's testimony from her witness statement about that last meeting in Dublin Castle with her dad. And um, she accompanied her mum. And uh, she says that uh, we were brought into the room where daddy was. And they say the room that Connolly was held in in Dublin Castle is usually the first room on the tour that you go to um, after you come up the stairs. Um, he lifts his head and said, I suppose you know what this means. Mama was terribly upset. I remember he said to me, we were talking about various things. He said, put your hand under the bedclothes. He slipped paper into my hand. He said, get that out if you can. It's my last statement. Mama could hardly talk. Um, I remember he said, don't cry, Lily, you will unman me. Mama said, but you're a beautiful life, James. She wept, hasn't it been a full life? Isn't this a good end, he said. Then he took us, then they took us away and we got home. We just stood at the window, pulled up the blind and watched for the dawn. And then that morning, James Con a dying man was taken from Dublin Castle to the stone breakage yard in Comanum Jail. He wasn't even held in Comanum Jail um, where he was executed, tied to a chair. And, you know, it was, the, so many people felt the loss of James Connolly, but you can imagine the impact that it had on his children. Um, but as Nora says, you know, they had to be strong. They had to carry on. Now, what is really, really sad is that you, when you look at the pensions uh, later on, now, the, the pensions were offered in 1924, the military service pensions. Now, the widows and families did receive some money um, after the rise and from the Irish National Aid and Volunteer Dependence Fund. It was set up by Tom Clark's wife, Kathleen. But it wasn't very much money to start with. So the girls coming to Mono had to organise and collect funds. And Lily Connolly did receive, with the other widows, £50. Um, but Lily, like so many of the women, um, had 
a big family. Um, Nora was working, but Nora couldn't get work. Um, it was really, really difficult at that time. And she had, you know, two young kids. Uh, Roddy was only 16. Um, so three young kids, sorry. So they were in, in dire straits. And this letter, and this is written in 1924. So Lily Connolly had applied for a pension from the new Irish Free State. Um, and the hoop that she was made to jump through. It is off when you read these, these pension applications. Um, because especially when it comes to the women, of the type of questions they were asked to prove that they had been involved. And the work that the women did was seen as uh, not dangerous because it was political work. Um, and it was ridiculous. Like they really did not want to give money to anyone, it seems. But here is Lily Connolly. In dire, dire conditions um, in 1924, her husband's only dead eight years um, and she is in um, a difficult position. And here we have um, a letter being written on our behalf um, to Richard Mulcahy, um, who was uh, the Minister for Defence. And here it is. Um, so some months ago, Mrs. James Connolly applied for a pension under the Army Pensions Act, but so far has not had any word about her claim and has no idea as to when it is likely to be dealt with. Um, she has found it rather difficult to make ends meet during recent years and at the present moment is rather embarrassed for want of some real money. And this is what you find with... The, the, the women, this sense of pride. And Lily Connolly was one proud woman and she could make she could make everything out of nothing. Ina talks about that constantly. She was always sacrificing for her kids. Our family was everything to her. Um, so uh, she has one daughter who was a medical student in her last year and it is hoped that she will be qualified in the next six or eight months. Perhaps she will be able to inform me whether it is likely that our claim would be disposed of at an early date and whether it would be possible for you to do anything to expedite it being dealt with. And if in the event there being any considerable delay in the matter, whether it would be possible for her to get a payment on account. Right now, fair play, I have to say, to Richard Mulcahy because he dealt with this. Um, there's no way James Connolly's wife should have been writing or getting people to write letters on her behalf. She was James Connolly's wife. Um, and here we have Richard Mulcahy's response. Um, attached is one type of one of the type of cases which I was speaking to you about. And this wasn't unique. This Richard Mulcahy was obviously getting these letters from women like Lily Connolly, um, whose cases were not being dealt with. And one which is utterly inexcusable has not been dealt with us uh, long ago. It should not take one day to get evidence that James Connolly was executed in 1916. It should not take one other day to verify that the applicant is his widow. So just imagine that, that the wife of James Connolly had to prove that her husband was executed in 1916. Um, and then it continues, um, pensions might have some uh, appreciation that if a woman loses her husband and has a family, that she has been through very difficult circumstances and actually in very difficult circumstances at the present time, wherever a bit of luck even may come her way. Is there any chance of having a forced payment of pension in this particular case made inside seven days, namely before the 15th of February 1924? And fair play, he did get it sorted but just the thoughts of that and unfortunately it's replicated with Nora later on and um, so after 1916 Nora um, she went to America because there was no work she even tried to get work in Belfast but there was nothing and um, she couldn't get a passport though so she contacted contacted Margaret Skinner who was a member of the Glasgow branch of Come in the Month but come over in 1916 was in Stevens Green was actually shot um, at the College of Surgeons leading a, a, a sort of attack party um, out of the Irish Citizen Army very good friend Countess Markovich and she organised for Nora to, to get a passport and Nora went to America. But see, the thing was that 1916, although they were defeated, it was only a battle in the war and the propaganda war was so important. And this is where the women come into their own and they started pretty much after 1916. And you have girls like Nora, you have uh, Margaret Skinner, you have uh, John Brennan, uh, the uh, uh, Sydney Zara Gifford, um, the Ryans, um, I think it's Min Ryan went to America. All these girls that had been involved or some connection to 1916, they're out doing this lecture tour in America. They were telling the people in America what had happened. And of course, having the daughter of James Connolly um, <coughs> was a huge, huge coup. 
for uh, furthering the, the, the Republican cause. Um, and she remained there. And here we have Nora writing in her pension application of her activities and what she did and there she goes she was refused a passport to um the usa she came to glasgow this is Margaret skin they're writing on our behalf um and then they left for uh, glasgow for the usa in july 1916 um, and they continued their work. The lecture tour was very, very successful in gaining support for the Republican movement. And while they were there, they met Lee Mellows, who had escaped after 1916. Um, she returned with me in July 1918 and on arrival received an internment order um, at Liverpool. Um, prohibiting, prohibiting her return to Ireland. Now, she wasn't the only one. Hannah Shee Skeffington, the same thing had happened to her because she was in America um, and the same thing happened. She was stopped from entering, uh, going back to Ireland. Um, she came with uh, Margaret Skinner to Glasgow and left there as a result of police inquiries and succeeded in returning to Ireland uh, with the help of Peter Murphy in Liverpool. And then during 1919, 1920 and 1921, so the War of Independence, um, her main activities were speaking um, um, at meetings in Ireland, England and Scotland. And Ina um, was pretty much the same. Um, now she remained in Ireland after 1916, so it was Nora that went away, but she moved to London in 1918. And that's where she assisted the London IRA because there were IRA units in Scotland and uh, England and so on. Um, and she was a member <coughs> of the Irish Self-Determination League, so this was the league that was in England trying to sort of, you know, uh, promote the, the, the cause for Irish independence. Um, and in 1920, you had William O'Brien standing in a by-election. Now, William O'Brien was their father's very good friend, was a trade union organiser. That's whose house Roddy had been sent to in 1916. Um, but he was interned. He was in now prison since 1916. But Ina, she campaigned on his behalf because at that time when that by-election happened, he was in Wormwood Scrubs. And another thing that she was doing, because Michael Collins had people all over the place bringing messages to and from prisons, Ina did this in the case of William O'Brien and Michael Collins. So although they weren't... Um, they weren't in Ireland necessarily. They were doing the important work. It was the political work, and um, which is deemed not to be important by the uh, pension board. And in 1920, uh, in June, uh, Ina got married to Archie Heron, um, and here you see them together. And uh, he was a, a, a radical Protestant activist, um, and he had been involved in 1916, um, and they got married in 1920. So you can see there, like a, a lot of couples at this stage, um, they they met through their activities, their activism, and they then got married. But the War of Independence ended in July 1921. It was followed by the treaty negotiations and the Anglo-Irish Treaty was signed in December 1921, which granted Ireland dominion status for 26 counties. Uh, those 26 counties would become a free state. Six northeastern counties would remain part of the British Empire. They had been partitioned with the Government of Ireland Act in 1920. And the big, big bugbear, of course, was the oath of allegiance or oath of faithfulness that um, Irish politicians had to take to the Irish or to the British crown. And the 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 debates that take place um about the treaty are heartbreaking and they're all uh, documented or available online Europe.ie. And when you see and read those debates, it is just it's so sad because you see the relationships breaking down. Um, despite their best efforts to avoid civil war, the inevitable could not be avoided. Um, it was six long months, January to June 1922, but the inevitable happened. And the women, the majority of the women of coming them on, um, opposed the treaty. Um, the IRA, that split. The FINA, the majority, if not all of them, went anti-treaty. And Nora and Ina, they both opposed the treaty. And during the Civil War, they were there when it began. Um, so the anti-treaty IRA had taken up positions in Dublin City. The four courts on the River Liffey was their headquarters, but they also took over buildings in O'Connell Street. So you have, if you can imagine, 1916 in the general post office, 
So the west side of O'Connell Street, that's where James Connolly made his stand for the Irish Republic alongside his son and alongside many people that Nora and Ina knew. Six years later, Nora and Ina are pretty much on the opposite side of the street. They were in the Tara Hall in Gloucester Street. It was a trade union hall. And they were making a stand for the Irish Republic. Um, they were going between the Tara Hall, which was a forced aid post, and the Gresham. Uh, Nora's future husband, Seamus O'Brien, uh, he was in the Gresham. Um, and the fighting in Dublin, it lasted from the 28th of June to the 5th of July. Once the four courts fell, the pro-treaty side, the National Army, then focused their attention on basically um, ending the, the fighting in Dublin City. They were intent on destroying what was called the block, which was the buildings that were occupied by um, the anti-treaty forces, including coming them on, which included Nora and Ina Connolly and included the Gresham Hotel. Um, now, after that fighting ended, Ina, it seems, just she, she didn't play a role anymore. However, um, Sorry, I did say that was uh, Nora's future husband. Nora had actually only recently been married um, before the Civil War began. And her and her husband, Seamus, um, after the fight in Dublin had ended in Dublin City Centre, um, they managed to go home, um, but they were arrested because they were still active. And both were in prison. Seamus was in prison in Mount Joy. Um, Nora was in Kilmainham and the North Dublin Union. Um, they actually spent their first years, the first wedding anniversary apart um, because they were both in prison. Now, in 1923, the Civil War ended and um, there was a reluctance to release the anti-treaty prisoners um, from prison, uh, even despite the fact that the conflict was over. Um, and they were being held for what seemed an indefinite period because a lot of them were just interned. They weren't charged. Um, and you have then the hunger strike um, that takes place. And Seamus O'Brien was involved in the hunger strike in order to be released um, because the war was over and that was that. And eventually Nora and Seamus were released. And then what happens after? Um, so the two sisters, they were they were activists throughout their lives um, in, 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 in big ways and in small ways. But these two girls, these two women, I should say now, um, they did continue to make a difference. Um, we see this photograph of Nora. This was actually taken shortly before she died. Um, but in 1926, 27, she founded the Irish Workers' Party with her brother Roddy. It, it didn't last that long. Um, Nora and her husband, they joined the Irish Labour Party and they lived in Drimna. Um, just uh, up near Crumlin um, and that's where they ran the Drimna branch um, of the Irish Labour Party. Then in 1957 to 1969 she was a senator and um, she was nominated by Emma de Valera, she was nominated by Noel Lamas, Jack Lynch didn't deem it you know didn't deem it important to to nominate her but she had uh, 12 years as a senator and she, thank god she 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 while she was there she did her job i'd say she really annoyed a lot of people because she blocked so many bills and i was shocked when when i saw one of the bills that was put forward and um, it was actually one sort of initiated by the church and um, that was they wanted to put female juvenile offenders in the Magdalen laundries and Nora blocked it so there you have real real difference you know being made and thank god for some of our senators the women senators like we know that women were sort of ostracized from big politics but they were involved in the senate and wherever the women could make a difference in local politics because that's really where the power was as well let's face it they could make a difference they did make a difference and there is a prime example of a real difference being made Nora stepping in to protect those who had not got a voice um, she supported the provisional IRA during the Troubles and in 1971, 17th of June, um, she died. She was 88 years old and she's buried in Glasnevin Cemetery. Um, and I mentioned earlier Lily's difficulties in trying to get a pension. Nora, history repeated itself. 
So we have this letter written, I think this is around 1941, possibly, um, not sure on the date, but Nora um, had fallen on hard times, her husband had fallen on hard times, they weren't, they needed help. And you do find that certainly with the women, there is a lot of pride that a lot of them really only apply for the pension if they desperately need the money. They didn't do this for money. Um, and you do you do find that with the men as well. But you do find a lot of it with the women. And here you have, just like our mother, the, the, the questions they were asking. Now, I know didn't have that problem but for whatever reason Nora Connolly they just had to get she had to get so many letters to prove what she had done in 1916 like they knew what she did in 1916 but she had to prove it and here she is writing a desperate letter because they still hadn't dealt with it and she said I'm at my wit's end we are absolutely on the on the rocks now, how much more clearly can you make it? Um, this week will see the end of us unless I have something definite uh, to count upon. So they're literally uh, on the brink. They're, they're, they're destitute. Um, Seamus has had no luck in finding any kind of a job. I was hoping that the pension um, business could be hurried up and what it could get might tide us um, uh, until his over his, his bad spell. Um, there seems no prospect of anything here so we have uh we have to either we have to go to england uh, applying for jobs or write to england applying for jobs i'm absolutely blue despondent down and out hopeless and at the end of my tether i'm relying on you to show me or throw me a lifeline and there's the daughter of james Connolly writing to the pension board a begging letter asking for money asking for help it did come. She got the grade A. That was the lowest. Um, the majority of people got the grade A. As I said, they just didn't want it. seems didn't want to give money to anyone. But just imagine, it had happened with her mother, and there is history repeating itself. As I said, thankfully, I didn't have that um that problem, but for some reason, Nora did. And Ina, um, she well, she was involved in um the the Irish. Uh, she was actually honorary secretary to the Irish Save the Children Fund. Again, the poverty that was in Dublin, that was in uh, Ireland at the time. We all know the mass emigration, big families, and so on. Um, and she was the honorary secretary to the Irish Save the Children Fund, which was a fund set up to help and try and relieve the pressure on mothers trying to give their kids a better future exactly what their mother had done for them when they were growing up um and Ina herself she wrote a biography about her dad and she was she took part in many lectures she's in and out of the newspaper she was on the radio and so on then of course the two sisters they gave those interviews to RTA which are now on the RTA archives and um, website so do have a look at them and she died in 1980 she was 84 years of age so there is the sister, the story of Nora and Ina, Ina Connolly. Um, they were revolutionary daughters, but it wasn't just from their father. Their mother had a role to play in the girls' activism as well. And whereas their father gave them their sense of duty in terms of to the working class and um, workers' rights, um, what their mother gave them was that sense of real social justice. Their father would have given them that as well. But that sense of social justice, and we see it with Ina, with that Save the Children Fund, that if you can, we see it with Nora with blocking that bill for the Magdalene when he wants to put the young girls into the Magdalene laundries. Um, if you can speak for people who haven't got a voice, you do it. And the thing was, is that like James Connolly, like Lily, um, the Connolly girls knew exactly what they were fighting for because they themselves had lived through it. But James Connolly did say to Nora in his last, the last time that he saw her, um, he was saying something like, you know, don't be crying, you know, be strong. I'm proud of you. Um, we will rise again. And I certainly, I do know that James and Lily Connolly could be nothing but proud of their daughters because they continued the work of both their father and mother. And they did make 
a real difference to the lives of the ordinary people of Ireland. Thank you.